Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. My guest today is a new friend of mine, Lou Phillips. I met Lou uh, through a mutual friend a few months ago. We got to know each other. Then the more I got to know Lou, the more I'm like, man, you would make a great fit for the Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender. So we actually recently hired Lou as our Director of Church Relations. Uh, Lou studied at Oxford University for a year, um, and he has spent many years, about eight years, uh, speaking on college campuses, like secular college campuses, about largely about the topic of uh, Christian sexuality. So, uh, and he just has a great way of communicating God's word in a winsome, gracious, uh, articulate way, um, especially when he's in like really volatile environments. Like that doesn't seem to bother him at all. So, we just, th- this conversation kind of went all over the map on all things related to sex, sexuality, apologetics, the gospel, the church, uh, Gen Z and so on and so forth. So please welcome to the show for the first time, the one and only Lou Phillips. All right. Hey, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. I'm here in the basement live, uh, recording live. <laughs> what is this? We're, we're both physically in the basement, That's right. uh, the Theology in the Raw basement. Um, and I'm here with uh, Lou Phillips. Lou ha- is a, uh, a guy I've gotten to know over the last few months, really. Yeah. Um, but man, we just, um, you, know, the, you know those moments where you're talking to somebody and you just you end up finishing each other's sentences. And I feel like that's what it's been like. Like yeah. just as we talk about like a theology of marriage and singleness, especially, and just even LGBTQ stuff, um, a lot of uh, like-mindedness. So anyway, thanks for coming down to my basement. I know yeah, it's kind of hot down here right now. It's a privilege to be here. Thank <laughs> you for having me. So I, I wanted to have, have you on the podcast because you have spent the last like eight years doing kind of like apologetic type speaking largely in, yeah. in, in audiences where secular audiences, college campuses, like you've been in pretty, like probably really intense spaces talking about really intense, controversial things. Yeah. And I remember at first asking you like, oh my gosh, is that super stressful? You're like, no, I love it. Like, this is great. Yeah. Like <laughs> are people yelling and screaming at you? And you're like, no, it's, it's been like really great. So yeah. um, why don't you tell us a little bit about, yeah, what, what you've been doing the last eight years. I mean, I kind of set the table. Yeah. But. I mean, um, I got really passionate about the topic of sexuality, um, kind of early on. It was something as a Christian, I, I just tried to take seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, it was something, uh, I really, lo- I really respected how my parents actually kind of addressed the topic. My dad was kind of like, if you're old enough to ask questions, you're old enough to know answers to those questions. Huh. And I think some might disagree, but like, I loved it. It's like when I got, when I was just trying to figure some things out, my dad was real clear. So like, this is who we are as Christians. This is what God believes. This is what you're Hmm. kind of expected to do. And so I would say that that understanding of sexuality was just kind of ingrained in me um, really early on. And so I always wanted to honor God uh, with my sexuality. Um, but I grew up in the youngest of six kids. So, uh, yeah. and uh, I was kind of the black sheep of the family in the sense that all my siblings got married kind of young. I mean, early twenties, mm-hmm. all of them. Um, and you know, had kid, I, I, my first sibling got married when I was like nine or 10 and I became an uncle when I was 16 years old. So I've been around marriage and family, uh, for a long time and I've, I've loved it. But one thing I really saw was like, um, I think it was being oversold is the way I would describe it. Marriage. And, and, yeah. Marriage, marriage, and, yeah. marriage and family. It's like, this is, this is the end all be all. And I don't mean it as in like, it wasn't an intentional thing. Mm-hmm. It was actually just the way people live their lives. And I just got to sit back and see, it's like, well, wait a second. There, I, I found a contentment in a, in a just satisfaction in, in my relationship with Christ. Like there was just something there it was like, nothing's going to be able to, to satisfy the inner angst of my soul quite like God himself. Cause I was ultimately created for him and to know him and to love him. So there was like this, I felt like from Christians, there was just this overselling, like this is the thing that is going to satisfy you. And yet, when I saw it, and again, I saw it up close, and I'm not talking about, my, it's not like my siblings' marriages are bad. They're good. Like, they're healthy. They are um, they have phenomenal families, and even my parents. But I just kept seeing, like, there, there's, this is not the answer. I can just tell you that. I know it enough in my heart. And so singleness was just a big thing for me, and and I loved being single. Um, I just recently got married. That's why I'm saying I loved being <laughs> single. Um, but I really was at the point of, like, I don't, I don't even know if I'm going to get married just because I've found such contentment in who um, Christ created me in my relationship mm. with him. So I, I give you that whole back, backstory just to be like, so I've been really passionate about speaking on this topic because I feel like the topic of sexuality is the largest obstacle mm-hmm. to people accepting the gospel. Like younger people, all primarily younger people. I would or? say pre- predominantly young people, but it's still affecting, it's affecting yeah. my age and even above me right now because yeah. – 
I think, unfortunately, we as a church, has ju- we've just done a very poor job of explaining why we believe what we believe. Yeah. I think we've given people the most shallow, cheap version of the truth. And yet, <laughs> you know, we, we talk about how Christ is the bread of life. Like, he's the one that satisfies. He's the one that's created us to be in relationship with him. But the way we live our lives is actually that marriage and family will actually be mm-hmm. that thing. Right. And so we're, we're telling a bunch of people, yeah. oh, no, 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 Christ is the satisfying thing. Yet. We act like marriages, and then we tell a whole group of people, but you can't have it. And we want to know why <laughs> so people true. are so frustrated with what we have to say. Yeah. And part of it is because we're, we're idolizing something that isn't the true thing. It's, yeah. it's, it's not the ultimate thing. And so as I've been speaking on this, I'm trying to get – especially when I'm in secular contexts or contexts, I'm just trying to <laughs> – initially just try to show people I'm not arbitrarily bigoted. Like yeah. I've, I've actually really thought – deeply about this. And I think there's some things, some answers that Christians have given that just aren't biblical that I, I was, I've been trying to correct, but then there's things like, no, no, like there's some truth to why we believe what, what, what people mm-hmm. have been telling you, but here's the greater truth behind that. And so I love it. Um, I, I think it's, and I, I, I mean, you asked like, does it get, did it get hostile? My answer is no, because I think there's a, I think one, we like to caricaturize people on both sides. I think you, you, all of us, we treat Christians like a monolith and, mm. and people of the LGBTQ plus community as monolith. So we assume like, and you hear these vocal arguments. Yeah. But when it's you, a loud minority on the it's fringes so, it that truly you think represents is, yeah. the majority. Every time I've had conversations with people that c- completely disagree with me, but are willing to actually hear me out um, mm. and, and I'll answer any question they have for me, it goes so well. I'm not. Really? I, are they running to the cross? No, <laughs> but they are making one step closer. They're like, I didn't, I didn't know Christianity said that. I didn't know. introduced to a better version of what they assume Christianity. Yeah. And that's what I'm, I'm just trying to remove that barrier. But now, I mean, as you know, this is one of the reasons, um, Mm -hmm. uh, I just am so passionate about this topic. It's like, I'm really trying to focus on the church now because I I feel like I've been trying to compel those who, as somebody that was doing apologetics and evangelism, I was really passionate about getting people that didn't know the, the Christian gospel to know it and accept it and, and live for him. But I found myself preaching, um, things about sexuality that the churches that I was involved, um, the Christians that I was surrounded with, uh, inviting their friends to come to the church, but the churches didn't believe what I was saying or didn't know what I was saying. Or and, and so I was like, okay, we really need to make sure we we get the church to know this topic well, um, stay theologically grounded. We don't need to fold on our our, our beliefs. I I don't believe that for a second. Mm-hmm. But there's a way to go about this that matters um, and that can truly impact people's lives. Mm-hmm. And that's why, yeah. yeah. Sorry what, for a really so you, long answer. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> fine. Um, you, you've been on the campus. Uh, you said like MIT. Yep. Uh, other, uh, name a few that other people. Yeah, I was. Um, so I was. I was living in Maine, um, just just north of Boston. So I was on. Yeah, Boston University, MIT, okay. University of New Hampshire, um, Colby College. Okay. Um, some other schools, but then also around the country too. I was just right. based out of New England, okay. but then, yeah, I was just traveling oh. around. What, what are some main, I'm curious, like when you go and you speak and you always have like a Q and a time or is that like, yeah, every- no, that was, that's my favorite thing in the world. Actually. <laughs> I actually, Mine too, but I want to do, I want to do as test. little speaking as possible. I yeah. just want to talk long enough to give us a diving platform to get yeah, okay, into yeah. what they want to actually that's talk good. about, because it's like, you, I don't know where you're at. I don't yeah. know what question you really have. I can take some assumption based yeah. off of I know yeah. where the conversation is. So yeah, no, I would always probably do about twice the amount, if not three times the amount of Q&A time versus how That's much time so I'd good. speak. Yeah. I want to come back to that. I wonder if there's, because that seems to be what people want. I don't know. Yeah. Like whenever I go speak on on this topic and maybe the venue is kind of different, it's, it's that kind of down to earth, real dialogical audience involved kind of, in environment, I think a lot of people really like and they learn from. Yeah. And my the question I always have is, how come we don't do that in, in church? <laughs> is it oh yeah. no, but that's not that's that works out here, but not in the church, or is it just well, people wouldn't know what to do with that anyway? I want to I'll come back to that. But sure. Yeah. What, what are some questions that primarily uh, non Christians have asked you, like? Um, anything stand out like, like really good questions or, or even when you gave a response to somebody and they're like, Oh wow. And they, they really kind of thought through it. Like, can you, are there moments that stand out or like, man, that was really a, uh, kind of a most unpredictable moment or, or like a really sweet God moment. That, yeah. Um, um, you know, there was one time I was speaking at the university of Massachusetts Amherst and, um, we were doing a series of, um, five day event series on wow. our college campus and it was great. And, um, I was doing Q and a and someone just stood up is a very frustrated, um, 
student. Um, this is the one time it didn't go okay. that well. Yeah. But okay. <laughs> but he just gets up and starts using pretty graphic language about how much he enjoys sex and how this oh. is the church is like so re- I grew up in a Baptist church and I've just been so repressed all these this boom 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 and just like kept just swearing and all that. I was like, oh yeah. and I I mean that kind of stuff I like. I love when someone can speak to me candidly. I right. love I I hate that false sense of yeah. like pastor. I mean he was just aggressive and I was like good. Like I <laughs> and I share with him and my heart actually just broke. He was somebody that was so lied to actually by the church. He wasn't the things he was saying that the church told him. I'm like, ah, oh, I wish, huh. I wish you would have known that that wasn't true. Actually. Um, some of it does get into the purity nerve. Some of it was just like this idea of like, if you're even remotely, um, if you're living in sin, uh, like and having any type of sexual immorality, you will be miserable. You won't, you won't even love life. And, oh, yeah, and he's yeah. just like, well, I'm actually really loving this. So you guys yeah. just lied to me. And so I loved being able to sit there, not retaliate. I didn't come at him like, don't, how dare you use that language? <laughs> I actually, I told him, I was like, I, I appreciate your candor. I love how candid you were with me. And I just told him, I was like, um, one, I just want to say I'm, I'm really sorry. Um, because I, I know I wasn't the one in your church. I can't apologize for Christians, but I just want to let you, I'm just, I'm sorry to hear that that's been your experience in the church because I can assure you that's not how Christ would have treated you. Uh, um, I, and I, yeah. I know that because I've seen in scripture how he treated those who really wrestled with what he had to say. Um, and from that experience, but then getting into all the other questions, so much of it come from pain. Mm. Almost every single question. It's not this theological, like, oh, I really don't like it. It's, um, why is God so unjust? Why is it, it seems so mm-hmm. unfair that he would have this type of ethic when it comes to sexuality, when my experience is this, mm-hmm. um, does God even love me? Because I've been told the amount of, oh my goodness, the amount of Christians, and I know you know this as well, the amount of, yeah. um, people who walked away from the church who were told ultimately that they themselves are an abomination. They themselves are a mistake and there, there's no way God like yeah. could well, love real them. Real quick, was this guy gay? I, I, or not? No, this okay. person, uh, he was in a, uh, polyamorous relationship oh, okay. though. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it was interesting. Yeah. We were yeah. talking yeah. in that sense, but no, he was on, but he, and that's the thing. A lot of people, I think a lot of Christians think, oh, it's, this is where we've done wrong. It's just in, specifically within that realm. Like, no, no, no. It's actually, there's so many huh. people walking around with pain and shame, just heterosexuals as well, yeah. based off of what they were told, um, how to live the standard of, cause it, it is one of those areas. Like we have grace for so many things in the mm-hmm. church, but when it comes to sexual immorality, mm-hmm. we are like, we get very, um, judgmental. Mm-hmm. Part of that, I want to be, there's a reason why. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think it's completely um, arbitrary or like we just want to overemphasize. I don't think it's that actually. I mean, Paul talks about this. Like, Scripture why, comes down pretty hard. Exactly. It's like, yeah. you actually sin against your body. Mm-hmm. What, what, what are you talking about there? And I always say like, look, if, if marriage and sexuality ultimately have the, the ability to point us to the most beautiful thing God ever has done in mm-hmm. creation, what, what, what is this all going mm-hmm. to? Well, then it has the it has the potential to, that pendulum is going to swing and be mm. extremely harmful to us. And this is where God's care and kindness comes in. It's like this isn't God just like arbitrarily like follow my rules because I really want to see if you'll do it. It's like no, no, I love you, and I've created these things very specifically for a very unique thing. And and just like any good gift I give you, you use it outside of its context. Quite frankly, it's not going to go well for you. Right. And you may not see that for years. I, I mean, I don't like not, the yeah, harm argument. I actually good, it yeah. drives me insane. Actually, when people are like. <laughs> No, no, sin will always. It's like no. Sometimes you don't see sin. I mean, like I, I you'll was be miserable the second you sin. I was addicted know? to pornography for ten years. Huh. Never saw the harm. Huh. It didn't take it actually until about to get into marriage that I start seeing the harmful effects oh, of what wow. it did, and it was so frustrating. It's like ah, yeah, because I could. Because if you go into all all sin is harmful, when you don't see sin, you won't think it's. I mean, when you don't see harm, you don't think it's sin. You're you're willing to justify all these things. So. When you don't see harm, you don't think it's sin. That's a yeah. great... Yeah, and that is, like, you you asked me, like, you know, what are some of the questions, like, and, and we were talking about this yesterday, yeah. like, um, I was sitting down with a, a group of teenagers um, asking them, like, I could tell they did not like what I was saying. <laughs> I, I could tell they did not agree with me on, like, what does the Bible actually say about these things? And I just said, fine, you know what? Scrap what I said. What what should God believe? Like, honestly, <laughs> if, you're, if you were God, if you were creating this whole thing, what do you think God should say about sexuality and, and marriage? I love that phrase because it's like, that's exactly what people are f- thinking and feeling. But when you say it out loud, it just sounds a little audacious. No, I know. What do you but, think yeah, God should believe? <laughs> yeah, it's like, <laughs> and they're, they're kind of taken back. But they essentially came up with three points. And I yeah. really respect the points that they, they came out because I loved how they are. They said, if I like something, um, it doesn't hurt anybody. Mm-hmm. And it feels innate, then God should be okay with it. 
Sure like God should not. Happen. Like it feels it's natural to me. I'm not like I can't possibly change that. It's just like a desire of mine, essentially, like a good, like innate desire of mine. And if it's innate, God put it there is kind of the they, exactly. Do they say that, or is that kind of what they're? That's they, a, that's how they'd be wor- wording it. And it was so funny when they first when they first told me that. I I mm. sat there for a while and I was trying to show them with like just worldview why that's an inconsistent thing. And but the only way I could actually get them to see it was like I had to go to extremes, and I actually don't like doing that. I think that's Christians do this all the time. Yeah, yeah. We quickly will go to like the worst version. I was like, that's not. It works occasionally, but it looks like you have no idea what you're talking about when the only thing you can go to is like the worst version of everything. It's like, that's Mm -hmm. not Mm -hmm. what I'm trying to do. So it took me a couple of weeks to just sit there and I was just praying and asking the Lord, I'm like, how do I answer that question? Why? And one, at first it made me realize, oh, this is actually, we need to start peeling back. What's our definition of sin? Because right. if, if your definition of sin is harm or doing doing bad things that harm others or yourself, then yeah, actually, this one doesn't make too much sense. But if, you, if your definition of sin is actually an assault on God, it's mm-hmm. God, I want to be God and you, I don't want you to be God. Mm-hmm. Well, that changes things hmm. fundamentally. Um, but I also remember like when I looked, I was just going through Genesis again. I'm like, Lord, just kind of show me how do I uh, tackle this and seeing – Going back to the the garden and seeing that the original sin and how that went down, I, I found it really fascinating. And I did not; it's not like I fabricated the story to make it work. But it's like there were three things that Eve saw about the tree: that it was good for food, that it was a, a delight to the eyes, and it was desired to make one wise. Oh, wow. And so it's no harm. I like it, and it's a desire. <laughs> and it was like it's the same thing that's happening here. It's just it's just packaged differently. It's like, but essentially, what is the heart? God, you're withholding something good from me and I can't trust you. In fact, I need to do something to, I need to show that I'm I'm actually better at being God than you in my life. And that's what I see happening right now. And and here's the thing. Nothing about the tree was described as bad looking. In fact, it would look good. Like, like, I think we, we kind of present like, no, no, sexual immorality. Like you'll look at it like this is, no, sometimes it's actually really appealing. Mm-hmm. Like if there really is an enemy of our souls, if there is someone that was adamantly trying to get us to not know and love God, he's going to find some creative ways for us to just yeah. find unique ways to just be God. Cause what is the heart of sin? Mm-hmm. God, I'm God. You're not. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I think the questions range from a lot of things, but what I see is like, it's pain, it's frustration. It's how I've been treated. Mm-hmm. And then there's an aspect of that fairness. And that's where I think this, this yeah. last question comes in. It's like, is God fair? Um, but yeah. And then how would you answer that? Is God fair? It's like, what do you, what does that even mean? Like, yeah. Cause I, I mean, life just by definition. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, some people are like, is it fair that I'm a Christian and somebody born into a Muslim yeah. household in Saudi Arabia is not a Christian? I was born yeah. into a somewhat Christian home, you know, or I was born and I wasn't in a abusive situation. Some people were born, they didn't choose that environment and they're... Yeah whole they were abused yeah. uh, maybe they were born with an addiction or a family environment or born in the poverty and, and or layers and layers of poverty you know like in a whatever um maybe they were born five foot two you know and and you know gained weight a lot easier because yeah. of genetics or you know there's yeah. so many you know some people are born with you know six foot four chiseled body they're good looking they have a great personality all these things that are not something they chose yeah. and that's gonna have a can have a really positive effect on their life. And I don't know, it's just the whole idea of like fairness. There's, there's, or even, you know, I thought about, I was in a conversation with somebody the other day about like when it comes to like sexuality and consent, Mm -hmm. like if it's consensual, but I'm like, what is consent? Like does a female porn star who's being, I, I don't, I mean, let's just say kind of, borderline borderline maybe abused by sure. by men and i mean um from what i hear it just keeps getting more and more violent more and more male centered more and more almost like somebody said very i think it was bill maher that said it's like very rapey or you know like just um but she's not she's choosing to be in that mm-hmm. maybe uh, because she was down and out maybe she was abused maybe she needed the money or whatever so she's consenting to that role yeah but the power dynamics are horrific yeah and the byproduct of that consensual relationship, yeah. if we can even call it that, are horrific on women and children and, and yeah. trafficking. You know, so there's so many things wrong with this consensual relationship. Mm-hmm. You know, um, she's not intending harm, but there could be an unintentional harm that comes about yeah. from it. So I even I just 
even the ethics of consent and harm, I think, are really thin and naive when most people kind of use that as kind of the grid. The oh, if it's oh, yeah. consensual and doesn't harm, then it's fine. It's like well, let's let's linger there for a little yeah. bit. I've wandered all around there. But no, I no, I, I but any... no, I, I I completely agree with you on that one. I think that is one of the cheapest arguments people can try and use. The consent, when, yeah, and, yeah, because it's just like <laughs> if. You talk to people about what what are they really wanting. This is why I mean, we get, we get back to the justice part of this. You want to know why this is such a hard question for us? Because we actually believe this is the this is the epitome of life. This is the thing that brings value to my life. Mm-hmm. And for me not to actually be able to live this out, it's repressive and it's subhuman. And the reason, to your point, why we don't shake our fists at God and say, "I'm never going to be a Christian," you know, because it's it is extremely unfair that I was born in one of the most wealthy countries mm-hmm. in the most wealthy time of all history. Yet there are people mm-hmm. just thousands of miles away that will never see or have access to the same wealth that I will have in my life. Mm-hmm. Some people would shake their fist at, but that's just, that's not the question right now. Why? Well, it's because we all r- realize that does money help? Sure. But is it the meaning of life? No. Yeah. But you know what is the meaning of life? Sexual expression and me, and me getting to fully okay. express. So hmm. this one is different in my, in my, this is where I want to challenge people. It's like, okay, so if that's true, how do you know if it is? Because my challenge to so many young people is like, um, it is insanity, truly the definition of insanity, to think more of what you already have will bring you happiness. You're currently mm. sleeping around. You are currently living out your sexuality to the extent that you want to. Did it work? Are you – yeah. No, I've not had a single person. Really? Uh, not one. I ask that question all the time. And I always I wonder that. Like in my mind, I think like, nope. okay, you – the sexual – complete sexual freedom does that bring you la- like no, true fulfillment? i've not heard a single part and if they're honest with you now and, and i also give this caveat i was like i'm not talking about is it fun i'm not talking about do you enjoy it in the moment i was like i'd be an idiot yeah. to not say like of course yeah. that's why that's why we're we're engaging in this we enjoy these things. i'm asking you did it do the thing people promised yeah. you it would do like brought meaning in life yes and like, are I you done fully- are you done questioning the meaning of your are you done questioning that inner ang- and i say i describe it as that inner angst of your soul like are you are you fulfilled in that sense i've not met a single person so that that's, then my challenge is like, okay, so then why are you so convinced that if God has something to say about this one, mm-hmm. that you're willing to fold the entire faith? Because I think you've actually been pitched something that's a lie. What which do is they that, say? That's compelling, I think. Well, um, how do they be, do they, it, they, it, do it, they, it, they, it like, depends. Really yeah. I think it depends on who it is. Uh, some people are just like, yeah, but uh, this is who I am. Like, this is more of who I, I am, am than, and I, and I would say it's like, yeah, I, I don't blame you for that. Everything around you has said that from the day one. I mean, I once was flying home from London and I needed to, I was flying back to Atlanta from London and I just, I, and I wanted to stay up cause I knew I, right when I get to, to Atlanta, I wanted to go to bed and I didn't want to take it. So I was just watching movies. I watched three or four movies. I can't remember if it was four or three, but every and it was, one was a comedy, one was a, um, action and one was uh, an animated film. I was getting all the varieties in there. <laughs> there was one core theme that every single one of them showed me. And this is as a single, it's like, you're no one until you have someone. Wow. Like that's just, it's everywhere. Someone meaning a romantic. Yes. A romantic relationship. Way more. Not a good friend. Yeah, exactly. That, so it is not, I don't, I'm not telling everybody, like, you're an idiot for believing. It's like, no, no, it is one of the most compelling narratives. And again, as a Christian, what do we believe? No, no, we believe this, this unique thing, this thing called sex that God's designed ultimately for marriage between one man and woman, it has the potential of mirroring the exact relationship God wants with you. Hmm. If you don't think that's going to somehow at all alter, like, I mean, there is something we crave there. Like there is something that like we, we want. And so like, that makes sense to me that it would be something that we're craving. The question is, would it be unfair for God to say, yeah, but for some, no. Only, my answer is this, only if this is the life we, this is the only life we have. And this is the thing I need to be fulfilled. Hmm. Hmm. But th- that this is where I don't think enough Christians see it. One, we don't believe this is the only life we have. And two, it's actually blatantly obvious in scripture that this is not something you need to be fulfilled. Because the moment we say that sexuality and romantic relationship and marriage is essential for you to live a, 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 I mean, a fulfilled life is the moment we say that Christ lived a subhuman life. Because mm-hmm. right, he didn't right, do it. Right, right, right. And then you see what Paul has to say about it. It's like, it's just this, like, again, it's an over-appreciation of a good gift. Like I, I say, I just got married about... Uh, yesterday what's today yesterday was um four months i love my wife i think she is the most lovely person i've ever met in my and i'm so undeserving of who she is as a person honestly um she doesn't even compare to christ wow. 
And I mean that. I say that with, and I know she would say the exact same thing. My relationship with her, it can only point me more to him. In fact, the, when it doesn't, it's because I'm actually idolizing something. Like marriage is supposed to point you to the one relationship that actually would satisfy you, mm-hmm. not satisfy you in itself. And so, and then that last point, man, the fact that there is no, this is another thing I've never actually heard a pastor preach on when it gets me so frustrated. Um, Matthew 22, right? There is no marriage. No marriage in heaven. Yeah, yeah there's no marriage in heaven. What does that mean? Like, mm-hmm. what does that mean for us right now? And I, and the way I try to describe to people, like, especially as like, I, I say it's a very similar to why we don't do animal sacrifices. I'm like, well, what do you mean? It's like, well, what, what, what were we doing with animal sacrifice in the Old Testament? Did they ever really atone for sin? No, they didn't. We see in Hebrews, actually, they were pointing to the one mm-hmm. sacrifice that would atone for sin. Mm-hmm. So once the, the Lamb of God slain for this for the sins of the world. Mm-hmm. Once that happened, we're, it, they're obsolete. We don't mm-hmm. do it anymore. Why? Because they were pointing to the one thing that would do it. Why in the end is there no more marriage? Right. Because the entire point of marriage yeah. is to point to the one that will. You can almost say there's no marriage, there's no shadow of a marriage in the resurrection, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In, in as much as human marriages point to the ultimate, grand, most yeah. fulfilling marriage of us being one in 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 Christ um, fully, yeah. you know, um, then the, then the shadow doesn't need to be there anymore. We, we we're in the real thing. Yeah, and, and the fact that that like freaks people out. They're like, oh, that sounds like a bummer. I'm just married to God. That no, kind of shows that maybe shows we've the elevated idol- the yeah. shadow no, above. The thing we, and I think the way you know, it's funny. I was always taught, oh yeah, like um, there's the metaphor of Christ and His bride. Oh yeah, <laughs> and for marriage, it's like no, no, it's actually the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> we are the metaphors. Yeah, we're the thing that doesn't exist in it. Like our marriages that we have right now, as good as they can be, as yeah. as good as God's designed them to be, are a shadow. It, they are the thing pointing to the real thing. And more Christians need to say it because we'll never give a compelling answer to this world when we try to say that, no, no, it's not that big of a deal if you never get this, Mm -hmm. yet everything about my life is shaped by this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It does seem unfair. It does seem ridiculous. And I I don't blame people that don't want to have anything to do with it because they've never been told, by the way, hey, this this won't do the thing you think it will. This is is a beautiful thing, but it's difficult. (laughs) Um, But the satisfaction that God himself can bring you, that like... Man, I love that Christ describes himself as the bread of life. Yeah. Like, what does he mean? Like, and I, I've tasted that. I mean it. And like, I'm so grateful for it because I, I think I went into marriage and I know trials are going to come. I'm not saying I'm, I'm doing this perfectly at all. I just went into marriage knowing she's not, she can't do what he can do. She can't fully. She'll touch never touch. She'll never touch that part. Can she show, can she point me back to it? 100%. Can I try and point her back to him? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And that's what, that's the beauty of marriage because now we get to hold this so lightly of saying, yeah, no, what a cool gift I get right now, mm-hmm. but I never need it actually. Did I want it? Sure. And and if we would, gosh, and this is the shortest, <laughs> this is the shortest part of our lives. <laughs> this is like, and I don't, yeah. we, we as Christians don't even think about it. We think of even our theology of the resurrection. We, we think of heaven and we, we do, we talk about heaven actually is just like, yeah, and this part, it's like, no, we we have a bodily resurrection. Like, yeah, we're yeah. the only worldview that touches that. Like, yeah. you get a new body, and there is a new earth. Like, this is the shortest part of your life, mm-hmm. and yet there's so much more that he's going to offer, and yet he's asking, will you just, will you obey me in this? Because I actually have something far better for mm-hmm, you. Mm-hmm. And everyone, everyone has access to that, access to that regardless mm-hmm. of orientation, regardless of gender. The answer to all of us is, will you repent of your sin, deny mm-hmm. yourself, and take up your cross? I, like, I'm curious, just to kind of broaden it out a little bit, like just on that last note, this idea of really living with the hope of resurrection, not hope like I wish it to come, but like the hope yeah. of oh. the confident reliance upon this future reality that is 100% going to happen, you know? I feel like it has, and this uh, is kind of a blend of a technology question and a Gen Z question. Um, it's, I wonder, this is a true question. I just thought of this question right now. Is that belief like that living in light of the confident trust of resurrection, has that become extra hard to do in the last 10, 20 years when everything's so fast paced and, you know, social media has exacerbated things and something that was a huge cause a week ago is no longer. And everybody's, there's so much, I feel like, and I could be wrong, but it just seems like more than ever, there's such a strong pull to just look at what's right in front of you and, mm-hmm. and not even think about, like the whole idea, I love Eugene Peterson's phrase, you know, long obedience in the same direction. Mm-hmm. The thought of like doing something for 20 years, 30 years, mm-hmm. or like, I'm going to build into something that's not going to, I'm not going to see the fruit of this for a decade or something. Like that's just, 
so bizarre to the way we're thinking now. Yeah. Um, have you? Here's my question: um, If that is ve- even kind of, if I'm kind of onto something, maybe yeah. have you seen that? Like, it's much harder to get kind of younger people, especially that this is the only world they've known to truly live in light of something that's so far out, it seems that it's almost untouchable. Yeah. Um, And how do we get that back? Yeah. You know, I I definitely think like the time we live in for sure plays a role in that. I mean, gosh, even my attention span, I feel like has changed in the last 10 years. Like it's crazy. Um, I don't, I think there's a deeper root to that though. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't think it's simply all our attention spans are shorter. I think it's actually, (laughs) when your life is actually really good, and you don't mm. have the trial and you don't have to figure that like y- this can be a very, you know, like you can really pretend like this is, this is the only life I have. Like, mm. and I fight every day to remember, like, I just want to push for comfort. I just want to push yeah. for ease. I just yeah. want to enjoy. And I actually live my life sometimes. <laughs> like, this is the most important thing. Like, oh, yeah. God forbid I have to sacrifice anything. But when I, you know, I used to belong with a, a group of people. I mean, a, a team of speakers all across the world. When I would talk to my colleagues from different cultures in different countries, um, some of which who were, I mean, av- I mean, every day being persecuted, their their churches were being bombed yeah. every Sunday. They had to put up cement walls so that car bombs, and they still had church every day. Like, why? Like, wow. what? <laughs> what are you doing? Like, why would you keep like? I, Sometimes I struggle to want to go to church on Sundays because it's like, ah, I just, I just don't feel it's like today. It's kind of cold. You know what I'm saying? It's cold. I'm get wet between. What is my you car. know what is going on there? It's like. <laughs> When your when your love of God and your love of knowing that this life is not, this is the vanishing vapor. Hmm. I mean, it it changes the way you actually live your lives. And I just think because we're so comfortable, and I mm-hmm. think we're so, uh, and I I that's convicting for me to say because yeah. I push for comfort. We're in a, ve- I mean, especially in the West, we're in very wealthy societies. Even the poorest of us in the West are still doing significantly have more wealth access than a lot of mm-hmm. people, a lot of mm-hmm. cultures in the world, and. And this, is, this is the illusion. I mean, I even think when, when Christ talks about finances, like he's not doing it. Cause he thinks <laughs> he, it's the only thing where he's like, watch out, like mm-hmm. be careful. Everything else is like, get out of it. Don't like, this is not good for you. Finances, like money, get out, watch out. Cause it will creep up on you and mm-hmm. it will convince you of a, of a life that is just not mm-hmm. true. It's mm-hmm. an illusion. And I think it's just one more area we just have to become. Cause I do think that comfort and convenience comes in the beauty of like, I'm not dogging wealth and like blessing mm-hmm. and prosperity. It's just like, but we got to be careful because it is, it's a, one of those weird misleading, like it will convince you mm-hmm. to live this life well and enjoy it and mm-hmm. not to sacrifice anything, not to. Yeah. So I, I think that actually plays a huge role is to just yeah. the comfort and the ease that we have in life, because you can actually delude yourself into thinking that this is what it's all about. Yeah. But when men, when you're every day, being persecuted and your question, you don't know if it's the next day, man, the, the idea of eternity is so real. Mm. It's at the, mm. fo- I mean, you are thinking of like, and I, I mean, I think of Christ, I mean, uh, Paul and Philippians. I mean, what, how did he possibly say to live as Christ and to die as gain? What did, I mean, no. how? Well, cause look at him, look at what he was going through. Mm-hmm. This dude knew and loved Christ and was getting destroyed for it mm-hmm. in so many ways. And he's just like, look, I would love to stay here because I want to keep preaching. That's what, but oh my gosh, mm-hmm. do I, w- mm-hmm. I cannot wait to the day to yeah. be in heaven like, and, and with him. So do you think like, um, yeah, and going back to the wealth thing, like uh, has all this excessive comfort and wealth in America, um, has it produced true human flourishing? You know, why, why do we, <laughs> why are we among the leaders in anxiety and depression and yeah. loneliness and suicidality and all these? I think that's true at least. Um, yeah. Or yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it's, I think evidentially it shows itself to be true what you're saying yeah. that um, simply pursuing wealth, simply pursuing comfort and all these things does not actually, you know, I think God warns us from it partly um, because it doesn't resonate with how he's wired creation. And, but also, also he's like, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't going to make you happy. This isn't yeah. going to lead to your flourishing. Yeah. Um, do you think, um, uh, I want, I, so with Gen Z, cause most of your work has been with talking to not just, just uh, what 25 and under ish. Um, yeah, I'd say most of it. Okay. Yeah. Most of it would be 25 and under. I, I mean, I've, I've talked to a lot of adults as well, but I would say probably 60% is, okay. is 25 and younger. 
So besides sexuality, what are some of the main questions they're, they're wrestling with? And maybe questions that is unique to that demographic that maybe older people aren't, um, hmm. or maybe I guess it doesn't need to be unique, but yeah, what are yeah. some of the main, <laughs> the main reasons why they don't want to be all in, in follow Jesus, you know, like what are the saints, the, the roadblocks? Is it a problem of evil? Like, I just doesn't yeah. seem like that's a just God. Is it, um, they don't have any theology of suffering and Christianity is all about <laughs> theology yeah. of suffering or. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, yeah, well it definitely is like, it doesn't matter what I'm speaking on. The first question will always be sexuality. That's really, like, Oh, okay. 100%. It is just, they're not even going to entertain. Has it always been, you've been doing this for eight years. Yeah. Is it got, is it increased? Yes. Or has it always been. I would say yes. I mean, obviously that's anecdotally. This is my life. Sure. I don't know. I don't want to speak on the whole right. there, but yes, I would say it's increased significantly because, um, yeah, I think this this generation has a huge heart for justice, and I actually right. think it's something we should applaud uh, as Christians because we, as Christians, should also want justice, right. and we should be those promoting it and seeking it. Um, where I think it gets, um, where I see the frustrations of a lot of um, Gen Z specifically is they'll be growing up in Christian households, and so they'll they'll take. Um, the beginning part of their worldview will start with Christian. I believe there's a God who created me. I believe he's loving and I believe he created me through the purpose. Mm -hmm. Then you jump to the end of their worldview. It's like, and I believe that there is an afterlife of sorts. I I don't think this is the only thing. I don't think I'm I'm a materialist, but then the questions of like morality and meaning come from completely the world around them. It doesn't come from Christianity. And when you try to blend those two things together, you get really frustrated because they don't go together. Mm. Um, You can't, get meaning and morality from a secular culture that believes nothing about this life is actually, there's no divine. There's no, and yet you want to know, like you can't, you can't get a lasting meaning on that one. Uh, because ultimately if we started with as an accident and we end in oblivion, the idea that you can try to argue with me that meaning has, there is a Mm. real meaning. is like, that can't be true. There's there's meaningless here is meaningless there. The in-between is also meaningless. Now I get to create my meaning on that, but everyone that knows what it feels like to create your own meaning, it's, it's a, it's a goalpost that's constantly changing. Mm -hmm. It's actually really frustrating to live a life like that. And so I see a lot of teens really getting so frustrated with like, I want to, I want to believe in this God of love. I want to believe, but like, but it doesn't, I don't see the way I'm learning what love is doesn't line up with what I think love should be. And yet, so what I mean by that is like, you're, you're taking a definition of love. You're starting with Christianity. You're getting a secular definition of what mm-hmm. love is. And then you're getting frustrated that God isn't loving the way he describes himself within scripture. <laughs> and that is like, now you can be like, you see that pattern, whether they would, they probably wouldn't articulate it like that, but that way, that way of thinking. You absolutely, see so yes, common. absolutely. Okay. It is like, let me borrow as much. Like, I'm just going to make sense of this word. And I'm like, and I told him, I like, look, you can do that. But that's a very inconsistent worldview. And you want to know why that matters is because eventually it will crumble and you probably don't think it will. And you can build a house on sand or concrete, right? Mm -hmm. You'll only know when the storm comes. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I think so many of us have just lived such privileged, comfortable lives that we've not even had a storm. We don't even know what it's like for our worldview to be just ripped from us. Mm -hmm. And so those that are holding to a very inconsistent worldview, I told them, like, look, in America, you can actually get away with it. In the West, you can get away with it for good a good amount of time. Mm-hmm. I mean, you live in a, a, a culture that actually does in some ways uphold an aspect of morality. It's like, mm-hmm. it's, it's easy to actually live an inconsistent worldview, but when push comes to shove, you're going to really figure out what you believe. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it takes that pain. Sometimes it takes the suffering to be like, Oh my gosh, why do I believe what I believe here? And yeah, that, that inconsistency there. And I tell them, I like, do it all you want, but don't get, fr- you can't get mad at Christianity for this, when you're the one that's inaccurately trying to apply what it's saying, like <laughs> at least go after Christianity and get frustrated for what it actually says mm-hmm. in its in its entirety and its completeness. Don't try to cherry pick and cheap like cheap in the world. You see of it, at, see of it, see it in all of its complexity, mm-hmm. all of its nuance, mm-hmm. and then make a decision. Don't try to just cheapen it because it's like. I mean, sorry, we talked about this. I think last night too. One of my biggest like challenges to somebody that's really wrestling with their faith. If they are Christian, they are about to abandon it. It's like, look, when you say no to something, you're saying yes to something else. Make sure you know what you're saying yes to. Cause I think a lot of people don't think that it's like, no, no, when I say no to Christian, I'm just done with that. And now I create, but you're saying yes to a secular worldview at that point. What does the secular worldview offer you at this? Like, Mm -hmm. what does it mean to be human? Right. Why, why does my life have any value? Why should I care about justice? Mm-hmm. Like, when did it become evolutionarily advantageous for me to be benevolent? And I, like, why do, why do all these things? 
I think you're not going to find a more consistent, a more compelling, and more loving worldview than Christianity. I'm mm-hmm. so I've looked at this long enough to be like, yeah, I've wrestled with this. Um, mm-hmm. But that that idea of like, because I do think if it's not sexuality, it's justice. It's mm-hmm. this heart of like, man, I want. You will not find a more compelling story of justice mm-hmm. and love than the cross. Yeah. That's good. And I want people to see that and just like, but it takes time. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, this, you, you, you're a scholar <laughs> and this, you know how complex scripture is. You know, mm-hmm. this is not something that you're just like, oh yeah, it's like, I kind of, it's like, no, yeah. it's tough. But with the humility, if we, if we go at it with humility and we just are willing to say, okay, Lord, what, what is going on here? And you look at, again, the whole thing, mm-hmm. gosh, if, it's like if somebody took, you know, one year of my life and tried to describe me as a person, be like, that's a very inaccurate view of who I am mm-hmm. as a person. Get the whole thing. Read it as one big narrative because that's essentially what it's doing. It's mm-hmm. not a bunch of stories. It is one narrative. It is one story, great mm-hmm. story of God redeeming mm-hmm. his people and wanting to reconcile relationships with those you, he created. I just thought this right now. Do you think a lot of people, when it, when it comes to like, when you say, if they say no to Christianity, what are you saying yes to? They, you know, I've, like you said, they haven't really thought through that. Even if they did get that far, they typically wouldn't say, okay, which other coherent worldview am I going to embrace? Yep. I think typically it's kind of a worldview of desire. Like, yep. why is justice a part of my worldview? Well, when I see injustice, I get fired up, yep. right? I'm, I'm passionate about that. Yeah. Um, why does the Christian sexual ethic not make sense? Why don't it doesn't resonate with my desires? So yep. do you feel like they'd end up almost intuitively forming a worldview that matches what they are desiring in in the moment, you know, going back to really, like, as long as my desires aren't harming anybody. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's a really good point. And I would say, yeah, I, I think it is. I guess it, Jamie it, Smith is, I'm kind of repeating what yeah. Smith would say about yep. you are what you love, yep. you know? Um, yeah. And it's, it's, and again, gosh, it's so compelling. It is yeah. like, I, I feel it's like, I want to, I want to kind of live, it. but, <laughs> and this is where I think Christianity just gets, again, just so profoundly beautiful and just like, the fact that it describes your and I, you and my heart mm-hmm. this way, that we actually just want to be in charge. That's the mm. hey, scrap what you think sin is, all these bad things. It's like sin is you genuinely want to be in charge. I want to I want to be going back to the God. garden, you're saying. Yeah, like it's like it, I yeah. want to be God. And that is every time we choose sin, it is me. It's just saying, God, I just think I'm a little smarter than you. I think mm-hmm. I could and we'd never say it, but that's what we're doing. Um but this idea that we're creating a, a worldview out of desire, it's like, okay, so okay, that's fine. What happens when you and another person have two conflicting desires? Who wins out here? Right. And right, what right. worldview actually allows you to love that individual and not mistreat them? <laughs> now I get it. Some people have used Christianity as as a as a, a club and, a, yeah, and yeah. actually mistreat it. But I'm saying you can't you can't judge a philosophy based on its abuse. You actually have to go off of what it's saying Mm -hmm. and give me, give me another worldview that tells you not to retaliate in a world of anger and frustration. Mm -hmm. Give me a worldview that says actually love your enemies and pray for them. Give me another worldview that actually says this isn't, you can actually rest and let God have, have the vengeance and have the the justice because he, he's trustworthy and he's good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's an eternity at stake. Like that to me is like, it's like saying no, for such a cheap reason. And it doesn't seem cheap at the time. I'm not trying to oversimplify it because it does seem so real for someone, like, especially if it's, if it is just, if it's just the pain in your life, like, no, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. But you're saying no without really saying, realizing what you're Mm -hmm. saying no to is what I say. And I don't say that as like, cause I figured out, it's like, no, I wrestle with this. I Mm -hmm. still have so many questions, Mm -hmm. but the cumulative data, the cumulative view, I'm like, Mm -hmm. ah, there's nothing better than this one. And it's so true. When you talk like this on, again, going back to like a secular campus, maybe at the beginning of your talk, there's skeptics, there's agnostics, atheists, or maybe Christians are kind of jaded, deconstructing. And if, yeah, we've been talking about 42 minutes. I mean, if you talk like this, do you see at least some people kind of like, oh wow, like rethinking a lot of the things they came in with? Or yeah, no, for like, sure. Have you seen success? Are you successful? What you do? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Did people become Christians? Yeah, <laughs> not to leave no, the Holy exactly. Spirit yeah, out no. of it, but <laughs> no, um, yeah, um, but again, I, I believe the role God's given me is to keep getting people closer, right? Mm-hmm. Just keep taking, remove obstacles, and yeah, I think. Helping them see Christianity more clearly, yeah. And because any- only look, only the Holy Spirit can get someone to fall in love with Christ. Right. I can't do that. Right. I, I just can't. I, there's not. It's not possible. There is a miraculous thing that happens for anybody that repents of their sin mm-hmm. and declares Christ their Lord. Like that is a profound thing that happens. Yeah. But I think He does desire to use us. 
I think he desires for us to play a role in that and what exactly that role is. It's, it's a hard mm-hmm. thing to pinpoint, but I, yes, I have absolutely seen. And I've also seen the other, I've seen people just like, no, I still, I'm not, I'm not content with that. But sometimes it's like, um, there's a difference between being a skeptic and a cynic. A skeptic mm-hmm. will actually entertain answers that they haven't thought of. A cynic, it doesn't matter what you say. Oh, um, okay. I'm not going to change my point of view. And at that and point, you, you can't, there's nothing I can do on that. There has to be mm-hmm. a heart transformation. You have to have some aspect of you. And I, I always tell people like, what's the falsifiable claim in your, in your worldview? Like how, how do you know if it's true or not? Like ours, I would say is the resurrection. I mean, everything hinges on that truly. Cause if Christ didn't do that, this is, right. I mean, Paul even says we are, we of all people should be pitied because yeah. we are fools. If this isn't okay. So then what is it? what does it look like to know if this is true? Well, let's, Mm -hmm. let's look at the history, historicity of the resurrection. What does it look like? Mm -hmm. Obviously we can't go back 2000 years, but if you come with the framework of saying the resurrection, like miracles can't happen and the resurrection can't happen because the miracles can't happen. I mean, that's just circular reasoning. You're not arguing anything. You're just, before you even go into it, you can't be convinced of it. So Mm -hmm. it's like, if this is possible, what would have happened? What does the evidence look like? And that's where I was like, yeah, there's, so it's, it's so many things like that. I, I tell people all the time, like I'm a Christian today, not because of one argument. Of, it's, it's all of it. it. It is the answer of suffering. It is the answer of, of creation. It is the answer of the resurrection. It is this personal relationship with God. It's all of those things. And that's why I, said, I think Christianity can be so fascinating because it's, it's simple enough for a child to understand. Mm-hmm. And yet the most brilliant minds, that have ever existed have you ever have never gotten to the bottom of it hmm. there's something so intric- intricately divine about christianity to me that i i've actually heard people say like look if christianity wasn't true i'd want to know who wrote scripture because i'd struggle not to worship them if it's what they're <laughs> like because when you do like when you're actually willing to sit under scripture, you see the beauty of all these things working together like mm-hmm. this is so not man-made and and this idea of of grace Mm -hmm. that to me is like this was not a man-made religion i'm sorry you can't you can't you can't weaponize grace you can't there's nothing to gain from it actually if if you were to create a religion and what you want to to use Mm -hmm. it grace is just unmerited like and a god that would be willing to do that and then yes i'm sorry i'm getting on tangents now no yes i have seen people change um with it but i have also seen people like no i'm not interested um, Even a cynic, I would imagine there's a there's a personal story that leads to cynicism. Yep. Probably, like you said earlier, a lot of pain, right? Yeah. I mean, there's um, that doesn't just come out of nowhere, yeah. right? I mean, well, I mean, maybe the last story here. Like, I was I was just at my church a few weeks ago or a few months ago, and my pastor was like, "Hey, this person just came in. They, they want to talk about quantum physics." Like, you know, I was like, oh, "Geez, okay." <laughs> uh, I was like, "Well, I know." Um, uh, whatever, I can dabble in this. I, I mean, I, I studied molecular biology in undergrad, but I'm a little rusty on all these things but i was like well let's talk about what what do you want to talk about yeah. and he came over to my house and we're just sitting there by fire i was like all right come on fire these questions we kept talking we kept talking we kept talking for hours and i was like answering his questions to to some level of competency yeah. i wasn't i definitely didn't know more he was a physics major and stuff but i was just showing him like well i think christianity and science are actually extremely compatible you've just been taught that they have to be and th- that they're not but it was so funny we kept asking answering 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 and then finally he's about to walk out of my house and he just says you know, can I actually ask, ask you one more question? I said, sure. And I was like, and I knew this, is, I've done this enough to be like, well, we never actually got to where this question was. We never really got to where, <laughs> and he just said, can I say like, I actually, my biggest hurdle with becoming a Christian is because I don't like what the Bible has to say about sexuality. Can you talk about that? <laughs> it came back Literally, that. it came back to that. And then here's a cool thing. We got to talk and I told him essentially what we were talking about today. And it was so sweet because the Lord was just pursuing him that weekend and I didn't do it. Uh, he, he like, after he talked to me, he talked to somebody else. And then he, I saw him on Sunday, uh, the next week. And he said, dude, after we, after I talked to you and everything, I just felt like the Lord just told me to, to repent of my sin and, and, and follow him. And it wow. just, changed. and again, I didn't lead him in a prayer. I'm not, I don't take any credit for it, but I, what I would say is like the Lord used me to start removing obstacles. And to I think reduce the white noise yep. that he thought was preventing him. But yep. really when you bring that down, yep. then you can kind of see clearly what are the main obstacles. Yep, that are what are the main obstacles, yeah. so yeah. Lou, thanks so much for being on uh, Theology in the Raw, man. Uh, I know you got to go catch a flight. And I, I do, don't I got to get out of here. So. Yeah. But yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah.
This show is part of the Converge Podcast Network. Hey friends, I just want to invite you to consider joining the Theology Nara Patreon community. This is a group of followers who believe in the ministry and work of Theology Nara and want to support it financially. And honestly, I've been so impacted by the people who have chosen to support this podcast. Um, every month they send in a bunch of questions. A lot of them are really personal and I get to spend time responding to them in a private podcast. And we, you know, we'll message each other throughout the month and post responses to each other's questions. Um, I'm actually going to start something new this fall, a month live Zoom chat with some of the members. And I'm super looking forward to actually seeing more of their faces every month. And there's other perks to come up. Like, you know, they all get free, uh, a free virtual pass to the Theology and Exiles in Babylon conference every year. But honestly, I don't want to make it sound transactional. Every single Patreon member that I've talked to says the same thing. We like all the perks. Uh, we're thankful for them, but we're just more thankful to support the ministry of theology in the raw, and we're glad to do so. So if this is you, if you've been impacted by Theology in the Raw, you can join the Theology in the Raw community for a minimum of five bucks a month by going to patreon.com forward slash Theology in the Raw. That's patreon.com forward slash Theology in the Raw. Um, the link is in the show notes. 